So what I'll do in the next uh, 25 minutes or so, take you through the long journey that we have gone through and share with you some of the excitement uh, when we started doing this work. Just to give you a very brief background, and then we'll take up some of the challenges, and depending on the how much time I have, I'll try to go through what I have collected on this very interesting area of uh, design and development. Background, as a uh, chairman already has said, that there was a national control law team, and the work center was at NAL, and we have been involved right from 1993 in the design and development of the flight control laws and air data algorithms, which are as important as the control laws for Tejas and its various variants. And as all of you are again aware, we have completed over 2,000 successful flights, touch wood, on 12 different prototypes, and most, not most, all of it have been incident-free as far as the FCS has been concerned. So I think that is a good achievement for doing something first. And as of now, we have reached the initial operational clearance and we have got the phase one certification. Whenever one talks about control laws, since there are a lot of youngsters here, I thought I will start with a little bit of basics and then go into the details. We normally associate control laws with the feedback and feed forward control laws, basically for stabilizing what we call the stability and command augmentation system. But, and there are certain specifications that one also has to adhere to in terms of stability, in terms of uh, the structural and also the robustness margins which are specified in the mill specs and standards. But more important, there's also another loop that gets closed through the pilot. Now the other two loops that I talked about earlier were all designed by man and it is something that if given the necessary amount of effort, we can model them very accurately. But as you see, this loop, what is known as the aircraft pilot coupling or the PIO loop, because there is a man involved and each pilot reacts to a situation very differently, designing this part of the loop is extremely challenging and there are no shortcuts to a large amount of simulation that is needed to ensure that though there are analytical and experimental criteria that one can use. And again, as I said, there are a lot of specifications that one bothers about. More important, since the model is constantly changing, you need to change the control laws and one way to know where you are in the envelope is to use the air data system, which gives you the speed of the aircraft, the Mach number, the altitude, and things like that, including the flow angles, because the aerodynamic parameters of the variable plant are also a function of these basic parameters. Therefore, in our case, we found that the air data system is as complex, if not more complex, especially a validated air data system, than the control loss, and this also takes a lot of effort. The other challenge is, what is the master when you fly this aircraft, because you get only local parameters, unlike the inertial sensors. So that, again, is a big challenge. And, of course, there are other issues, like all modern aircraft have to be carefree maneuvering, and therefore you need to build in the carefree maneuvering features, which I will also discuss in brief. And, of course, ultimately you have to have a low-speed flying claw to recover in case the pilot ignores your warnings. This is typically the control or design cycle. I don't want to dwell into it, but as you can see, there are hundreds and hundreds of hours of simulation that is done to ensure that before you put the pilot in the cockpit, that you are very sure that the aircraft is safe to fly, especially an aircraft that's being developed for the first time. Again, coming to air data calibration. What is it that is so challenging in designing a robust and reliable air data system? An aircraft of this nature, the Variation of the local parameters, because the sensors, unlike the inertial sensors like the accelerometers and rate gyros, do not give you the measurements that you want. They give what are known as the local parameters, and from these local parameters, be it the flow angles or the static pressure or the total pressure, one needs to get the free stream values. And depending on how well you have located your sensors, these conversion from the local to free stream and vice versa are also equally nonlinear and are again are functions of the variables they themselves measure like the Mach number, angle of attack and all that. So for us, having been done, being done for the first time, it was equally challenging. And as I said, this typically shows that since they give you the local values and you need 
the free stream values and to a level of accuracy that is plus minus 0.5 degrees in angle, flow angles and maybe less than a millibar when it comes to static and dynamic pressure, you can see that there are a lot of corrections that need to be implemented and the challenge here is what do you use as a master when you have a maneuvering aircraft for calibrating this air data system and since we were, as I said, going through all this for the first time, there was a lot of excitement and challenges. And when you start this, you start it based on CFD and internal values, but in flight you can have surprises, especially when you are in the transonic regime, you can have corrections which are very large as shown in the side probe plot on the right. The other problem is whenever you start design, you start design with the parameters and forces and moments that you get from a wind tunnel. And uh, this is the model that we now start with, and then we uh, have the application rules. We generate the forces and moments, and then we get the linear models. Anything? Yeah, I have the pointer. And uh, since we are at the present restricted to doing our designs in multiple linear models, we need to convert this nonlinear model into several linear models. And therefore, mathematical models to represent the airframe are extremely important. They are used for investigating aircraft performance, and we need to verify them in flight that what you have generated in the tunnel matches in flight. It is needed for updating flight control or design and verifying handling quality and flying quality compliance. And of course, once you now want to deliver a training simulator, you need accurate data for implementing on these simulators. And therefore, the other issue is, as long as the flight data matches with the wind tunnel. That is, let's say you have generated a model, you have put it into the simulator, and then you fly the aircraft and you try to plot the flight motion parameters for a given pilot input or a disturbance and match it with the simulator. As long as it matches the simulator, there's no problem. But you can have surprises, especially when you go into the nonlinear regimes, high G regimes, closer to the boundaries. And then what exactly happens is you could have differences from what you had used based on wind tunnel design. So what happens is you have to practically repeat what you have done in the wind tunnel in the air because now you have a flying aircraft and the flying aircraft is not a true representation of what you got from the tunnel. So this again, especially for a maneuvering flight, was an extremely challenging thing and it was only about four or five years back we got this expertise on how we could not only validate, that is check whether what is flying is a true representation of what you got from CFD and wind tunnel. And if it did not match, what is it that needs to be done? So practically a wind tunnel in the sky. And this was another challenge because we were doing it, as I said, again for the first time. And nonlinear dynamic updation is not a simple thing. And as you know, most aircraft programs spend thousands of flight hours trying to uh, validate and update the wind tunnel database. So this again was a challenge. And as you can see, the data that you use are extremely complex. I've just given you here what is known as the application rule for one of the pitching moment. We have three moments and three forces. And each of this, as you can see, are a, a function of a large number of variables which you obtain from the tunnel. And in case the flight trajectories do not match the wind tunnel, we need to now update this complex uh, summation of terms to match it. And that is not an easy job. So normally, this was another the area where we spent a lot of effort in modeling the aerodynamics in flight, and we used what is known as an incremental model approach, because the aerodynamicists who had given us the data were very reluctant to make any changes uh, to their original data set. So one way of getting over that problem is to add terms to this already complex uh, thing based on the trend lines as a function of variables, and then see how to get the system to match what is in flight. And as you can see, that the corrections themselves can be a function of large number of things. So what you need to do is, you have to get an input-output time history from flight, and then see where are the differences with what respect to what parameters, at what angles of attack, what Mach numbers, do you get the differences, and then add those correction terms. Further, Normally what you get from the tunnel and what you use in your model are the non-dimensional derivatives, but what you do in flight is actually scaled up and it's a dimensional derivative. So you also need to know your inertias and the uh, mass of the aircraft and the CG very accurately so that you can convert from dimensional to non-dimensional. 
we had a very simple fuel estimation system which was basically used for presenting the fuel data to the pilot and therefore we had to do something extra in order to get a very much more accurate uh, fuel estimate because fuel estimate in turn would give us the estimate of a mass of the aircraft because that was the only variable parameter during test. So this is what you do and this typically shows the flow chart on how we go about this thing. Why I'm spending so much time on that is it's a, it's a, a very challenging. For example, if you give a pilot input in flight and you may get only something like uh, 2.5 G, but actually your wind tunnel based data set shows 3, then you need to find out why there is this discrepancy for the same pilot input and how to correct it. For instance, this time it could be in the pitching moment as a function of angle of attack and you have to estimate this correction that I have shown. So actually, and since it's a, a multi-dimensional matrix that you need to update, it can be very uh, complex and time consuming. The other thing is all that we are talking about now and I think people who attended uh, uh, Dr. Mikhail Goman's lecture there knows that this is what we have been talking about so far has been the lower angles of attack where things are linear to some extent or if the nonlinearities are not so highly nonlinear and these are what are known as quasi steady aerodynamics. But once you go closer to stall and beyond, the aerodynamics becomes uh, unsteady and then the same equation that you see, the coefficients themselves become differential equations and you have to estimate them if you want to get a good handle of it. And why is this important? As I have said, you need it for pilot training because you have to demonstrate to the pilot when he is training himself in the simulator in case it departs what it would look like and also we need to ensure that uh, when we build in our carefree maneuvering systems that we have an adequately uh, adequate model of the required fidelity at the boundary conditions. And of course in civilian aircraft you also a function of safety programs like upset recovery which is now talked about and also it gives you a clear indication of what is the maximum angle of attack that you can safely use this aircraft in operation. And as I said, I don't want to spend too much time, but what I want to show you is that you might have a simple, this is an inversion of the CL alpha curve, which is in black, but if you have unsteady aerodynamics, then it's a function of the amplitude and the type of input conditions at which it enters, and so you have the hysteresis plots, and it's much more complex. The whole dynamics that you are trying to model now becomes very much more complex. And this typically shows that once you are able to ma master not only the uh, lower than stall aerodynamics but also the nonlinear high angle of attack aerodynamics, it is possible now to create on your simulator a high alpha model that will show to the pilot what would happen in case he departs and what sort of spin the aircraft would get in. LCA has is not only highly unstable in the lower regimes of angle of attack but is also oscillatory and uh, unstable even at the high angles of attack and has multiple modes of spin that making it that much more this thing. So there's a whole range of host of research activities where we need to work at and I would again seeing the large number of youngsters present is a very uh, what you call ideal area of research for youngsters and very challenging and today we have all the necessary wherewithal to do this and try it out not only in simulation maybe in flight soon. The other area that when you develop such systems is something which is not normally talked about in textbooks and things like an aircraft when it flies closer to an aircraft encounters the wake of the lead in aircraft and this could happen in a combat or in scenarios like in-flight refueling and many other cases. Now you want to make sure, especially a fly-by-wire aircraft because it has got a lot of sensors, uh, air data sensors which could get, uh, you know, uh, affected by the wake of the leading edge aircraft because normally what do you do when you have air data systems as I said each sensor measures what is known as the local value of that parameter and one way of how you ensure that all sensors are working is what you do by cross comparison and if the two sensors are close to each other then you are confident that yeah that the uh, value of the sensor that you are using for your downstream activities is sufficiently accurate for your use. But once you enter a wake, it could so happen that one vane could see an upward flow and the other one a downward flow and even a properly working system could be declared as failed because you are using um, cross comparison as your uh, failure detection technique. So we need to build in what is known as wake penetration resistant features into the air data system and this again to us 
was quite challenging because we had to model, first of all, the wake vortex in the simulator and then look at what is the effect of such wakes on the various sensing elements as well as the engine and the structural, uh, I mean structural elements of the aircraft. So this is something else that we also spent a lot of time and effort and today I am confident that we have a decent model which we are validating against flight tests by systematically doing flight tests and again this is a, a fairly large amount of work because you could enter this wake from multiple orientations of the uh, uh, I mean follow up aircraft in uh, relation to the lead in aircraft and therefore and you have to make sure that uh, the systems, the sensors and the flight control laws work adequately well even under these conditions. So this was again a very challenging area that we think and as I said it involves a lot of uh, modeling, especially the wake vortex of the lead aircraft and also fairly accurate models for your airframe, the flight control system, the air data system and the inverse air data systems. The other new element for us was uh, what is known as carefree limiting or carefree maneuvering. Carefree maneuvering essentially consists of two elements in most aircraft and one is known as the boundary limiting that is you don't allow the aircraft to exceed the boundaries and these boundaries could be rotational accelerations, it could be flow angularity like ang alpha and beta, the angle of attack and angle of side slip, it could be normal acceleration and the, so one way is you define a safe boundary for your aircraft and make sure through your flight control system you are always within this boundary limiting envelope. But what happens is when you are designing a new aircraft you have to make sure and validate these boundary limiters in flight and that again is not easy and it has to be done incrementally. The other problem with this uh, delta wing type of aircraft are the aerodynamics are extremely non-linear. You could have things like the pitching moment uh, characteristics, a local pitch up. You are extremely unstable at 19 degrees or 20 degrees of angle of attack but at 21, 22 you could become highly stable. Now unless you are able to detect this type of a characteristic in flight and take appropriate corrections in the flight control loss which we do 80 times a second, you can depart this aircraft. So basically you have what is known as the boundary limiting and what boundary limiting is basically, I will not get into the details, is what you normally do is as you keep approaching the boundary, you will start increasing your feedback gains so that it brings it back into the thing and also you use that as a signal to push down the nose and uh, also to keep the uh, angle of attack at the boundary you need to also introduce what is known as an integral uh, prote protection but the more integral feedback you use it's getting into technical details but what it does is it reduces your stability margins and therefore here also we introduced a novel concept of what is known as asymmetric stiffness feedback in order to retain the stability margins but at the same time control the uh, variable like the angle of attack at the boundary. This typically shows what would happen, it's just a time response plot of a simulation exercise and let us say this is the boundary that you have defined as a safe boundary and you want to keep your aircraft within this, below the red line, but it can so happen if I do not have this integrator you could have an overshoot and then recover and blue one shows what would happen if you had the integrator. So these type of designs are not easy to design because as I said you are operating in the nonlinear regime of the mathematical model and has to be validated in flight. The other thing is let's say uh, there are some maneuvers for instance let's take the pitch case on steep ascending flight trajectories your angle of attack may not reach anywhere close to stall but what happens is as you bleed out speed your engine does not develop enough thrust to support weight and at the same time because your dynamic pressure is reducing the control power effectiveness of your let's say the L1 in this case is not enough to push down the nose and recover from an angle of attack and therefore normally in such aircraft what you normally do is you give an oral and a visual warning to the pilot saying that you are approaching the boundary and if he continues to exceed this the control system takes control of the aircraft recovers it from this dangerous condition brings it to level flight and hands it back to the pilot. Now this may sound very simple when I say it in words but when it comes to implementation there are a lot of complexities. The other thing that happens is especially at very low speeds your uh, air data signals which as I said is used to detect what is the model of the aircraft at any instant of flight time also become unreliable and available 
and for such aircraft air data becomes crucial so it's very important that you don't allow the aircraft to drop in speed below a certain value called the v-min now the question is once having detected that you know you want to take control they are depending on the orientation of the aircraft the <laughs> flight path angle the roll angle things like that there are various mechanisms which you can recover the aircraft with minimum loss of energy one of the typical mechanisms is push over I'll not get into the details. There would be another one like a pull. What I'm trying to tell you is in case the pilot ignores your warnings and continues to let the aircraft drop in speed, you automatically take over control. But it's important that uh, having taken over control, you bring it back to a safe orientation with minimum loss of energy. And therefore, it is important first to detect that you are approaching a dangerous speed, the low speed condition. Then decide what is the best way to recover the aircraft and give those inputs automatically from the control system and recover it back to level flight. This could be the third. And each of these systems have got this advantage and this thing. And therefore, this just tells you the various steps. And, thing. and initially, to arrive at what is the best way to recover this aircraft would have to be manually carried out and then later on implemented in simulation. And therefore, what it essentially means is based on the aircraft configuration and the state, including the flight path angle, the roll angle, and the thrust, you have to decide, one, the best recovery strategy that the pilot is likely to adopt in order to accelerate the aircraft, and using simulations, verify this work, and also determine what is an important speed called the re-engage uh, speed. That is, you have to determine when do I take over control, and when do I hand over control back to the pilot. This typically shows uh, the complexity of the problem, you have a minimum speed below which your aircraft can get itself into trouble and depending on as I said the flight path angle and your current speed you have to determine at what because nothing happens instantaneously everything takes time for it to be activated so you can't take an action just close to the thing you have to have a lead before you take this action and as I said depending on the parameter combinations you have to also decide what type of a maneuver should the automatic control system put into the aircraft to recover it back safely and give it back again to the pilot. So this again is going, we have now got it all working in this thing. So this is what basically happens. As you are bleeding out speed, you give a warning to the pilot. If he doesn't take action, you take control over the aircraft. And before it hits the lower limit, you bring it back a level speed and give it back to the pilot. Now this looks, and as I said, there's a lot of computation that needs to be done and I'm just giving you some details. So it's basically a function of the speed of the aircraft and the flight path angle and normally the rates because you want a lead in to decide when you want to take this action. And therefore this in very short tells you what the problems are. So I'll not uh, spend uh, And then again, I will not get into the details. So. There are other issues that needs to do. You need to know, especially at lower speeds, your gravity terms and things like that. So your complexity of sensing also goes up much more in such type of uh, aircraft. I will not get into these details. But what is important is if you get the attitude information and the gravity terms into the thing, you get a much higher, better performance, both in terms of limiting as well as or things like the velocity vector turn, where you can see that from red to blue, you can keep the aircraft in much better control if you have attitude information in addition to your other inertial parameters like rates and accelerations, which currently we are still in the, I mean, implementing it so that we can incorporate the low speed recovery, which we'll be doing shortly. The other interesting thing, the last thing that I would like to show you is something that we have developed, which for us is equally exciting and we'll be testing it very shortly at Goa on the ramp that is being built uh, there what is known as the automatic ramp takeoff. Now, for a naval aircraft, normally an aircraft which is operating from uh, this thing like uh, a runway, you have typically for this class of aircraft anywhere between 600 to 800 meters of length available to build up speed, build up lift and take off. But in the case of a ship, you have only two choices. Either you use a catapult to accelerate the aircraft to that speed to generate the adequate amount of lift to, separate, I mean, to support the weight or what many other countries like Russia do is they have a ramp on the thing and then what happens is when you, as you travel on the ramp you release the aircraft in a semi-ballistic trajectory and then ultimately it becomes 
wing bone. And this one just shows the vector diagram of the various stages of this type of tekra. And the length that you have will be typically from about 160 to 200 meters. And you need to take off the same aircraft from this uh, deck in that shorter length. And that again is an extremely challenging thing because there are restrictions to that. One is, as I said, shortage of runway length. And it's also a very strong function of various other parameters like the mass and inertia of the aircraft. And there are also additional requirements. In order not to disorient the pilot, we also have to ensure that the flight path angle after it leaves the ramp is always positive. That means at no instant of time is the aircraft coming down like what's shown on the top. And it also puts a constraint on the minimum angle of attack, I mean maximum angle of attack, because beyond that angle of attack you could land up into a problem. And this is typically just tells you the conditions of such a takeoff. And what is interesting is for people who are flyers or have something, know something about flying, you can see that this type of uh, ramp takeoff, you see how fast the flight path angle changes, how fast the theta buildup occurs, and you can have G's of the order of 3, 2.5 to 3 G when you exit the ramp, and you can see the sort of pitch rate, that is the rate at which the nose oscillates itself can be very interesting. So it is quite disorienting and it needs a lot of training for pilots to take this aircraft from the deck of a ship. So what we have contemplated to do for the naval aircraft is to build in an automatic uh, hands-free takeoff mode wherein the pilot has just to ensure the center line tracking uh, with the pedals but the aircraft will take off automatically and the control will be given back to the pilot once he achieves wing bone flight. So this would help uh, getting the aircraft into the system much earlier with lesser amount of uh, training. So this again is a very challenging task for a Delta tailless Delta wing aircraft and this typically shows again what would happen if I did not have this ramp and I used a conventional control uh, system. So I thought I will just share with you in this limited amount of time what we have been doing for the LCA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sham, for that fantastic uh, guided tour of the entire uh, LCA design development of the sure. flight control. Sure. Uh, I'll just take one minute for myself. I remember at some school I was giving a lecture on this stability and control, etc. Somebody asked, what is this uh, unstable, what is this control, all this fun? I said the following to him, you take a bicycle, there's no rider, you just push it, it falls down. Yeah, it's unstable, fine, good. But you put a man on that, he doesn't know how to ride a bicycle, again it falls. Then you put something in his mind, then he will stabilize, then he is riding. So unstable system, stabilized. Then what is this, uh, some advanced? Advanced is, he, there are people in the circus, they lift the front wheel and still do the bicycling. Oh, that is advanced. Then what is the carefree high alpha? I said, front wheel lifted off, hands off, still he's cycling. That is the complexity of uh, <laughs> the control loss which he's talking about. So that's in the humorous way. I think we can have a couple of questions uh, focused to the speaker. I understand the subject is uh, highly, you know, uh, physics and math oriented, but uh, that, that's the reason why I put some humor in saying that it looks very simple, but to mimic the neural networks there and get that into kind of some kind of control uh, is not an easy task. Uh, that's a Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Pardon? No, I don't think so far it's easy to build a warning system that you have entered into wake. They are trying to do that for commercial airlines approaching an airport in order to reduce the number of separation between two aircraft so that they can accommodate a large number of aircraft in a given amount of time. But I think for a maneuvering aircraft, wherein your entry and exit could be at a very 
different things. I think it's extremely difficult to build in a warning system and expect the pilot in the short uh, span of time to take necessary evasive action. I think that's not possible. Okay. I think I have answered your question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we thank uh, Sri Shamshetty for a very interesting and informative uh, talk. May I request Chairman to present a small memento on behalf of the Seminar Organizing Committee.